former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Deep Datare, Tejji, Mr. and Mrs. Sananda Datare. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening. We are very glad that the former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, is with us today. It has been my privilege to work with him for 10 years as his special envoy. India's worldview has always been shaped by historical experience and contemporary developments. Centuries of connections with the outside world on a continuous basis with different religions and cultures, the colonial experience, the peaceful and democratic nature of our freedom struggle, and the fact that both partition and integration took place simultaneously at the time of independence cannot be underestimated. These have produced a culture of thinking in our country which promotes pluralism and democracy both within and amongst nations. This has, in a way, influenced our political, economic, security, and foreign policies. Well, with these few words, I welcome you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dejvi, and thank you very much to Aspen Ananta for organizing this. And let me begin with, uh, with a contention. If the character of a nation state is expressed in the conduct of its foreign policy, then India's foreign policy belies the very notion that it is a nation state, for that conceptual category was invented in the West. And India's diplomacy, quite evidently, is nothing like how Western nation states conduct their international relations. Let me illustrate with two examples. Unlike Europe or the United States, India is neither fixated on its borders nor on maintaining them. Rather, India seeks to blend the world. The example par excellence from recent times is the 123 Agreement, <clears throat> crafted by Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. The agreement broke a racially motivated and international barrier assiduously crafted by the West since World War II. In addition to this uncommon capacity of viewing the world in terms of not permanently divided units, but a totality, and in seeking to foster it, is India's ability to also not view the world as a zero-sum game, divided between permanent allies and enemies. For instance, no and contrast, New Delhi's excellent links with Tehran, Washington, and Jerusalem, with, on the other hand, the Western powers' alliance politics. Indeed, this is the norm, which reiterates Indian exceptionalism. In short, then, my project seeks to determine why New Delhi plays fast and loose with the borders upon which the West, and perhaps Peking's, diplomacy is founded, and how India does so. Let me give you the answer right away. The why and how of Indian diplomacy arises from a totally novel and perhaps uniquely Indian way of conceptualizing the world. In other words, Indians conceptualize the world in ways unavailable to foreigners, and hence New Delhi can operate in ways that confound other diplomatic services. This is because at the core of New Delhi's diplomacy is a worldview unlike the West. India's worldview is cosmological. When I say cosmological, I mean that Indians conceptualize themselves as inextricably intermeshed and interlinked with everything else in the universe. This belief makes for a way of approaching foreign policy quite novel. Firstly, 
India, unlike civilizations descended from Christianity or Islam, does not seek to move out of anarchy or what is called, known as jahiliya in an ordained manner so as to arrive at a utopia or paradise. In practical terms, what this means is that Indians, by dint of their culture, are not linear in their thinking. Instead, they are contextual. To explain, just as Indian diplomats make judgments based on their immediate context about what to do, so too does India decide how to act based on its immediate context. Let us take the case of individuals first. For instance, and in stark contrast to Western diplomats, no Indian diplomat I spoke to joined the Ministry of External Affairs for nationalistic reasons. Rather, diplomats join to improve their personal lives and the lives of their families and communities. This is contextual thinking at its best. For these people act in terms of their present context rather than some linear history intending to recapture some past and most likely imagined glory of the nation. It is a similar story for the Indian nation state. India's leaders have repeatedly stated that they are not interested in the gold that the West presumes is India's, that is, to become a great power. This is assumed by the West to be India's goal because, of course, the West seeks this. Instead, India's leaders constantly reiterate that the point of their diplomacy is to change the context of Indians which by and large is one of poverty. Hence the very rationale is alternate to the West. While it seeks to re recapture or maximize its glory, India simply seeks poverty alleviation and a better life for its people. Furthermore, the manner in which the kind of people who become Indian diplomats today and the state itself seeks to progress that is, eradicate poverty at the individual and national level, is also distinct. It is distinct because of the cosmological foundations of Indian progress. These foundations ensure that neither individuals nor the nation state can progress in a way that harms any other element in the cosmos. This is because in an interlinked cosmos, harming any element is a form of self-harm because we are, after all, all interlinked. Hence, Indians may undoubtedly progress, but only without harming anything. There is one final aspect of cosmological behavior. This interlinked cosmos idea that logically rules violence illogical may be challenged by those who don't follow a cosmological rationale. That suggests such people might be prone to violence and indeed seek to wipe out those who operate on a cosmological footing. The trick, therefore, is for the cosmologically minded to protect their idea, for it is virtuous, as it ensures nonviolence, but they have to protect the idea in a nonviolent manner. To do otherwise is impossible, for it betrays the core notion of an interlinked cosmos. The cosmological rationale I've outlined arises from my unprecedented access to India's foreign ministry. I was embedded in the NEA for over a year, a privilege that no other nation state has granted any outsider. The experience makes for a description of the NEA's presence, but the purpose of my project is to also explain the rationale of the practices that compose the presence. To do so, I sought not to repeat the mistakes that all analysts of Indian foreign policy make. They do one of two things. They either all fall back on categories developed in Europe, such as realism, idealism, and, and liberalism, to explain us Indians, or they say we are irrational, incapable of logical and systematic thought. To use European categories is, of course, not a sin. And realism, idealism, and liberalism may be applicable to Indians. But the total confusion of works that use those categories 
suggests that scholars are using the wrong tools to understand India. As for the contention that Indian diplomacy is somehow irrational, well, that sounds no different to what the British said about Indians, that we were too immature to rule ourselves, and hence we needed the stewardship of the British. Uninterested in repeating age-old prejudices, I instead sought to make sense of what Indian diplomats do in their own terms. Let me illustrate this with an example. Early on during my attachment with the NEA, I realized new probationers had very little idea of the job that they were supposed to do. They knew what an IAS officer does or what an IPS officer does, but not what a diplomat is expected to do. One day, the foreign secretary at the time came to speak to two batches of probationers. With decades of experience, he knew probationers had difficulty understanding their job. So he began by asking, how many of you know what your job entails? To this, everyone nodded to show that they had no idea. The foreign secretary then said, do you remember what Krishna was doing before the Great War? And everyone replied, yes. The foreign secretary then simply said, that is your job. Something wonderful had just happened at that moment. In an instant, some 40 new probationers immediately understood what their job was about. What is also significant is that these diplomats understood without reference to a European text, but something so Indian that it goes beyond the European concept of religion. After all, the Mahabharata, which is what the Foreign Secretary was talking about, is something Indians have known for centuries. Unlike the Arta Sastra, as Ambassador Lambra just mentioned, which is paraded by deluded nativist scholars who think that Indian originality lies in claiming the preceded Machiavellian thought and hence realism, the Mahabharata is something that the kind of people who become Indian diplomats today learnt in their mother's lap. They have done so ever since it was written by Brahmins in the language of the masses. And so influential was it that several Mughal rulers had it translated not as a religious text, but as a philosophical one. The Mahabharata then composes the very sinews of Indian society. Closer examination of the text provided explanations of how Indian diplomats and India's diplomacy can both be non-violent and move in ways quite unexpected. This is because the Mahabharata's lesson is that we li live in a cosmos, and hence all the rules of cosmological life that I outlined, including progressing contextually and in a non-violent manner, apply. One of the best illustrations of this is India's nuclear diplomacy, for it encompasses the history of the Indian nation state. India's nuclear diplomacy is usually presented, or rather always presented, as a learning process, with New Delhi starting as idealist and then wallowing in years of what is called ad hocism or irrational behavior. And then there was the moment of epiphany, when we supposedly learned the language of mutually assured destruction from the West. This learning to think like the West for mutually assured destruction was the West diplomacy, is for some scholars a sign of progress, and for others a sign of regress, depending on their political bent. But what this tale of our learning elides is that perhaps India's leaders were not confused or in need of education, nor that Indian diplomats were simply mimicking Western ways. <coughs> I propose instead that something completely different was and is at work. This becomes evident if only Western categories are ejected and research is conducted on the terms of the practitioners. That is, to make sense of the world in terms of the Indian diplomats who are conducting India's diplomacy. To do so avoids the phenomenal hubris so evident in so much writing that the people who have risen to the pinnacle of the Indian state are irrational, or that they are in constant need of tutelage from the West. 
Moreover, the framework I am proposing accounts for India's policy of no first use and credible minimal deterrence without denigrating the formulators of those policies as being solely concerned with mimicking the West or not quite knowing what they were doing. The cosmological framework then accounts for these practices by noting that India was faced with unimaginable violence that could erase the very idea of acting nonviolently, which is so central to Indians. The trick then, as I stated, was to defend the idea, but without replicating the actions of the violent, as in those who threatened India. Hence, India, unlike no other power, sought to challenge the nuclear world, but in a totally novel way. Not by threatening total disruption, but by something altogether different. A relatively minimal response that India assumed would hurt the aggressor enough to deter him from ever attacking. But how can an age-old idea ensconced in the Mahabharat motivate Indian nuclear diplomacy and diplomacy as a totality today? After all, India is presumed a Western copy. The West heroically transplanted its ideas here, and miraculously they took root. This astonishing story is, however, comprehensively undermined by my use of historical documents and sources dating back to pre-British times. The sources demonstrated what actually happened to the Mahabharat's logic of nonviolence. To cut a very detailed story short, under the Mughals, the Mahabharata was understood not as a religious text, but as, but as a philosophical one, as perhaps it was originally intended. If the ancient epic's influence persisted during the Mughal period, what came to pass under the British? Though they actually appropriated wholesale Mughal diplomatic practices, it was motivated, as in the diplomacy of the British, was motivated by something quite alien to the Mahabharat's unified cosmological rationale. Instead, the British operated in terms of a bordered world, which fructified into um, impermeable boundaries maintained by the newly invented concept of race. In practice, what this meant was that Indians and their ideas and reasons for conducting diplomacy were cut out of statecraft. And yet I argue that the Mahabharata's idea most cogently and without denigration explains what takes place today. Perplexing this is, so how does the Mahabharata's logic suffice as the only way to logically explain Indian diplomacy today? This is not, however, only because of the kind of Indians who become diplomats today knowing the epic stories and using them to make sense of the world, as the 40 probationers did when the foreign secretary came to them to explain to them what their job was. Why the Mahabharat, a text definitively extra-European, explains a state presumed Western at inception becomes apparent if something is done that no scholar has done so far. And that is to view Indian international relations in terms of the most significant relationship in our nation state's history, that between Jawaharlal Nehru and his mentor Mahatma Gandhi. Even a casual perusal of Gandhi's writings show how deeply he was influenced by the Mahabharata. But Gandhi modified the Mahabharata too by solving its greatest inconsistency. While the text forward the cosmos and nonviolence, the ancient epic was unable to offer a way of dealing with the violent in a nonviolent manner. Gandhi solved this quandary, and he did so by inventing Satyagraha, and his greatest disciple was, of course, Nehru. Nehru remains a subject of debate quite simply because he is understood in terms of either idealism or realism, or some such mixture. But this is an error for not reading Nehru in his own terms, to understand him as he presented himself. 
Doing so puts the rest to this age-old debate over Nehru, for he was neither a realist or an idealist, but the greatest practitioner of Satyagraha. In applying Gandhi's teachings to international relations, Nehru set in motion a type of foreign policy devoid of Western notions and which chimes with the everyday lives of the kind of people who are increasingly becoming India's missionaries today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of nonviolent action motivated by contextual thought. Thank you very much.